Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the September 2023 Compassion Chat. Here in Wisconsin, it's already starting to get dark. Oh, I'm so not ready for this. My name is Susan Marshall. I'm the author of Mom's Gone Missing, When Parents Changing Life Upends Yours, and your host for these chats. We meet the fourth Tuesday of every month at six o'clock Central Time right here on Zoom. Nobody's got to get in the car. Nobody goes anywhere. Dress up if you don't. If you don't want to, that's cool too. And oh, by the way, we have been doing this since March of 2021. You can see the entire archive at SusanAMarshall.com. There's a compassion chat button at the top. Click on that. It says archive. Click there. You can watch the whole library. We are we meet every month to bring together people with information and encouragement for caregivers of all kinds, but most particularly those caring for someone with cognitive de- decline dementia, Alzheimer's. And we've learned over the couple of years we've been doing this, that covers a very broad spectrum from mildly impaired to really almost totally impaired. Tonight, we are absolutely gifted with a woman who has spent a lot of time doing some really interesting things, um, but who has really come to dedicate her work, her heart, um, and really her energy to the topic of bullying. So we're going to get into that. It's not a happy topic at all, but Bev's got some great information for us. I will also mention we are recording this just as we have all of the others. So mute yourself, please, for the chat if you don't want to be on camera. And some of you already said, see ya, I'm off camera. Um, Bev and I will chat for however long we chat. And then we always open it up to questions, comments, stories, anything you would like to to share. So Beverly Davis started life where I'm going to let you tell your story, Bev. We always like to hear about the people who have joined us to share their wisdom, but your story is really quite unlikely, not only geographically where you started and ended up, but just Mm career-wise. So I want to welcome you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of everyone who will join us this evening and much later. Thank you for making time for us this evening. Oh, I want to thank you for this opportunity. This is something very special to me, and this is a very special yet painful topic, but it's a topic that we need to address. We can't uh, ignore it. It's never going to go away. Um, So I really appreciate any opportunity that I have where I can share this story and um, hear other people's story. That's very important to me. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. we like to get to know each of our guests. Your story is really quite remarkable as I've thought about it. So if you wouldn't mind, kind of give us the cliff notes, you know, how you got to be where you are now and what made you decide that this is the work you truly want to dedicate yourself to. Well, it's, you know, I'm 75, so the story is kind of long. Um, I was born <laughs> on the very far south side of Chicago. I'm um the fourth child in uh, the kind of what they call the caboose, and um, and I was in a family where my my father died when I was very young. It was kind of a dysfunctional family. Um, there was a lot of problems and people fighting, and so it was kind of hard for me. Um, I was always looking for a place to be safe, and um, had a hard time finding that because. When I uh, would go out in the community, it just seemed like there were bullies. There were, I don't know why I was being bullied, but I was being bullied. And, um, you know, people who are bullied don't just all hide. They keep looking for somebody who could be their friend. And I was hurt many times by people that I thought were going to be my friend. And that continues through your life, you're always looking for somebody that you can save, somebody you can count on. And um, I have found that they're few and far between, really honest, true blue people you can trust. Um, but as a kid, I was bullied in my in my school, uh, bullied in the playground. I don't know, but it happens. It just happens. And um, I think it really changes your your mind. You just always have this feeling that 
you can't, you, you're not safe. Something's going to happen. Don't take a chance. And um, don't talk. So I rarely talked in public most of my life. Um, very good one-on-one, -on -one, but this is completely beyond anything I ever thought I'd be doing. And look at you now. Look at you, Bev. This is awesome. Sorry. Continue, please. Yeah. Um, so uh, growing up, that was that was it. And um, I graduated from high school and um, had quite different career, different uh, jobs. I uh, eventually went to um, design school where I got uh, training to be an interior designer. So um, that was my career for many years. And um, I loved it. I loved it very much. And it was really a good career for somebody like me who likes to work one-on-one, -on -one, listen to people, see what they like, help them find what they like, help them live better in their house. And uh, that I loved it. And I did that for many, many years while raising my kids. And um, suddenly, though, in... Um, I don't know what it was in 2003. I felt this calling to uh, become go to school and become a pastor. Is there, yeah, bizarre, huh? But it happens that way. <laughs> well, highly unlikely, right? And and so we'll we'll come back to this in a little bit. But it is just one of those twists that really I had been. I loved what I did, but it just didn't fill this little spot in my heart that what I'm doing now does, which gives me the a know that I'm doing the right thing. Um, so I left my really good position at Marshall Field State Street Store, and I entered McCormick Theological Seminary, not really knowing what I was getting into, and um, graduated three years later with a Master of Divinity degree. And um, then I felt um, I, I wanted to do a chaplain residency because I've been uh, feeling pet chaplain work was my main, what I would be doing. Because I never, ever, ever thought I'd be preaching. You know, how can somebody who hard, hardly talks preach? But <laughs> I do it. Anyway, uh, I'm surprised myself every time. Uh, but anyway, I moved to Wasa to do a chaplain residency. And even there, I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to talk to these people about? You know, who's going to want to listen to me? Um, and one night I had I had the craziest dream that I had ever had. And I had never had a dream that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's about this little guy, this little elephant, Great Gray, who was born not quite perfect. Instead of having two perfect ears, I thought I had him here. I had a stuffed Great Gray. He ran away. <laughs> and one ear that's perfect. And the other ear on top of his head like that. So when I read to children, I always tell them, you know. And so in the, the dream, he's born like that. His parents, his father in particular, banish him. His mother was not much help either. They, um, they, are, they are elephants in captivity in India. And... Um, meant to carry the Maharaja. See, they're all dressed very, very, very fancy. Carry the Maharaja in a ceremonies. But Gray wasn't good enough for that because he didn't have perfect ears. So off he goes with his mahout. Uh, it, elephants born in captivity do not know how to feed themselves, how to uh, bathe themselves, pretty much nothing themselves. So they all have a, a mahout, which is a young boy. 
a young boy who does everything with him. He's with them 27 days out of the month. And the other few days he goes back to his family and they basically grow up together. So Gray and Santosh are sent off to work in um, construction. And while they're in construction, they're bullied by the other mahouts and elephants and, you know, and they just, but he keeps on doing things. He keeps doing, he keep, doesn't give up. And he ends up, I, mean, I want to tell you the whole story, but anyway, he ends up doing something very miraculous because he could use his ears to, to spell out words by using his ears, <laughs> spelling out the letters. And um, he saves he saves the town because he could feel here the water rushing in that would bring them a tsunami or, you know, a, just a large bunch of water. So he manages to get everybody off the, off the beach and up into the mountain and he saves them. And because he saves them, the Maharaja goes, he's not only carrying me in the parade, he's carrying my little boy. And what he does, he carries him in the festival and his ear is shading the little boy. So not only does he continue to do, to keep going and Santosh as well, he um, gets to be kind of glorified, you know, hey, you're not just plain old crazy ear. Oh, here he is. He's great. Adorable. <laughs> You know, Beverly, I finished reading that book and I thought, not only is it charming, it is such an important message because so many humans, I was going to say kids, but as you said earlier, being bullied changes your mind. And it's hard once you feel, well, even if you're not actively bullied, once you feel dismissed for whatever reason, there's always that defect. So uh, it, it, the, the book is lovely. There were two more gray books and then a monarch book that you've written. All of them have the same theme, right? You are wonderful the way you are. You have gifts that you need to, to use and to share. So I imagine that that is a big part of the motivation for your chaplaincy work. Definitely, definitely. Well, it gave me um, faith in myself to know that there was something that I needed to say and that whatever I said with the patients, it would be all right. And it also gave me courage to write sermons and give sermons. And, you know, um, I would say the most, one of the most important parts of this is that, yes, I was bullied, but I never, I really, for all these years, I hadn't thought of those people who did the bullying until I had the dream that became the book. And because of that, I peeled. And, you know, you're always like flashing back, but because of that, I peeled. And I think that's part of my story is I want to um, offer to other people, you know, time for healing and ways so to. And it is such a powerful message, Bev, and such a healing message. And the simplicity of the books make it so crystal clear that everybody can understand and say, you know what, gosh, I felt this way because something dad said, something mom said, my siblings were picking on me. I, you know, flunked the class, whatever that is. And as you said earlier, that does not go away. You you spent a portion of your time as a hospice chaplain, yes? How did you see this sort of manifest in that environment? I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, bullying? Just, yeah. So I, I think about, first of all, I want you to talk about some of the characteristics of bullies that you've come to conclude, because I think sometimes there's a line between being a bully 
-hmm. and acting unkindly out of frustration or fatigue. So talk a little bit about that. Well, in my experience, um, the bullies that I have, well, they're, they're all many different flavors, <laughs> you know, um, the ones that I have the most trouble with are the ones that befriend you or try to befriend you or, you know, pull you in so far and you're trusting and then ba-boom they lower the boom you know that's happened that's happened many times to me i am aware of that now so i you know i'm a little more guarded but i don't want to live a guarded life i don't want that i want to be able to to you know to not let that that person hurt me, you know, and I think I, I think I can get to that part. I think well, I can get to know that person as that person and not as a person who is going to hurt. Um, there are people who are just want to manipulate people. We, you know, we see that a lot of places, but there are people who I believe a lot of bullies have been bullied themselves, maybe in their home. Um, you you know, you don't know. We're hurting. We're, we we all have pain. We all have hurt. And then there's just some different ways that we um, manifest it and show it. And I think this gets very complicated in a caregiver role. Oh yes. And perhaps you have not yet healed, or even understood that you need to heal. And now you have this pressure and this deep sense of inadequacy. Now you're caring for someone with all kinds of noise around you. How come you didn't or how come you did? So so what have you seen in that regard, Bev? And how do you help people through that? Um, I saw, you know, some of that as a hospice chaplain, you know, um, a child who's taking care of of family member, maybe father, mother, who they really haven't had a wonderful relationship with and they were mistreated. Um, and how do they how do they put that pain aside and not, you know, put it on the person the most vulnerable at that time? Um, I, I've I saw that. I see it and in that work. Um, I also see it the other way around where the patient is still, you know, using that same manipulation to uh, hurt the person who's helping them. And it could be, it could be a family member. It could be um, a caregiver, you know, a paid caregiver from the hospital or the, um, facility where they're living, um, people experience and show pain and hurt by hurting others. And um, what I do when I, when I saw that w- would be to, well, if, if the son or daughter is hurting the mom or dad. Mm-hmm. I would just ask them if they wanted to go outside. I wouldn't say anything about it. I would just take them outside, you know, in the hallway or whatever. And, um, you know, talk about, not say, oh, don't do that to your mom. Just let's talk about how you feel about this. I know this isn't easy for you. This You're doing something you never thought you'd ever be doing. And, you know, if you didn't have a, a you know, a picture perfect relationship with your parent, that makes it even harder. So just kind of changing the picture and changing the perspective a little bit. Um get them getting them off that hurting route. Um that kind of helps. I mean until the next time, but maybe the more the more you do it and more you reassure them 
that yes, this you're doing something that is hurting because you've been hurt. And and isn't that really the definition of compassion? Real is is understanding, acknowledging the pain that someone's dealing with at the same time they are expected to care for someone else. Mm -hmm. So how, so our audience here is caregivers. Um, Many of us have not had a picture perfect relationship with parents, right? You and I talked about that when we had lunch Mm -hmm. and, and letting go of that can be a very, very difficult thing. And to that other family members who you assume had a better relationship with mom or dad than you did. And now we start brewing resentment um, because you know what, as kids, we never really grow up, do we? I don't know. Maybe we do, but (laughs) so, so give us some tips. Give us your thoughts on how, first of all, do you take down the temperature? How do you slow the music, if you will? And how do you not match negative energy with your own negative energy? Because that's the natural instinct, isn't it? Well, yes. I I think how, the best way that I can um, explain it is to use my family as an example. Because I'm, like I said, I'm the youngest of four. And very, I'm very much younger than, than the other ones. And um, of course, I, I did have a re- good relationship with my mother. Um, she kind of played us against each other. So we don't get, none of us get along, really, just borderline, you know, enough. And, uh, and I was always the one out. So when my mom was dying, um, it's gone about 30 something years now, uh, we did come as one thing we did as a family was just put her suggest that she go on hospice and she was agreeable. And let me tell you that was a miracle in itself. And um, because nobody, this was a while back because and hospice wasn't familiar. No, we didn't even know what it was probably way back then. Right. Not at all. Wow. And um, I, I, I was not involved in anything like that. I was a mother of two children and I did some interior design at that time. So this was all like new to me too. But I feel that something came over me. I probably the Holy Spirit, I don't know how, what other people would say, but told me that my mom needed peace and quiet before she would leave us. And my sisters were all over the place, talking, moving things around. And I finally got them to leave the room to go out for lunch because I hadn't had any time alone. And um, when they did that, I went into the room. My mom was not, you know, you know, in a coma. She was actively dying, and I could tell that. And I just told her, I said, mom, okay, it's time. You've done everything you can do. It's time for you to um, go, go, you know, rest. You've done everything you can do. We're all, all of us will be fine, you know. And um, I said a little prayer and held her hand and, I left her, um, left her alone for about a half an hour, and something told me in that half an hour she would be gone. And I went into the room, and her face was glowing. It was she was just beautiful, and she, and she was gone. She, I mean, she was the most rested and the most um, peaceful that I had ever seen her in my entire life. She never relaxed. She was always fighting, 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 you know, and um, that was such a relief to me. And I 
I tell that to people about that story. And I really think that that story is something that really assures people that not only is hospice <laughs> a wonderful thing to do, but putting that, putting that fear and that hurt on the back burner for that time, just so you can have that time with your parent without all that stuff. You can, you know, and I think that that what you just said, what you just described, having that time without the hurt, without the pain, without the guilt, without the resentment, I think probably intellectually we can appreciate that. How in the world do you emotionally, how did you get to that point after your sisters had left. So I'm, I'm going to guess what they had to say when you got back, but we'll get to that now. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how did you get to that place where you could finally just let things go? Was it instinctive? You said the Holy Spirit, which I totally believe. Um, but, but what happened to you in that process as well? Something told me that I needed to put that pain yeah put that pain away and just focus on be present where I, where I am and to uh, be and be in the present, you know, all that pain, you know, all that stuff happened and it's still there, but it wasn't there that day. What was there that day was our mom was taking her last breaths on this earth. She had had a rough life. But she raised four kids and, you know, we were all healthy and um, she has a lot of grandchildren and several, yeah, she has great grandchildren now. Um, she did good. She did good. And I want her to know that and go, okay, mom, you did good. Now go, go, go be with God. And um I really believe that hearing is the last um, sense to leave us because I've witnessed it in too many different situations as I've been with people. So I know that her, she heard me. She, she was not going to let go as long as my sisters were, you know, vacuuming and whatever. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, I think that is such a powerful sense that as caregivers, if we can learn, even if it's just for that visit that day, put all the stuff outside, lock it in your car, leave it outside the door, whatever it is. When you come to be with, just let that be. Now, flip the coin over. You mentioned mom or dad or whomever continuing to bully right now. So I'm the caregiver and I'm going to go see mom and she's going to continue to manipulate. She's going to continue to malign. Help me with that. Well, she was that way, you know, until she got to the point where she couldn't, um, you know, she, as she got sicker and sicker or less community, you know, well, she was a fighter, let me tell you. And she, yeah, she was that way. But I, I know it was hard for my sisters and it was hard for my brother to, um, maybe not my brother, but to separate from that. And she was never that awful, that mean with our, with my sisters. It was mostly, uh, but she was just, you know, just hard to be with. And for me, I just kind of, decided I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to get in that anymore. There were a lot of things that got me to the point where I wasn't going to get in, you know, arguing and fighting and it's not worth it anymore. We're, we can't fix it anymore. It's not going to go away. So what you have to do is really work on your own hurt, your own self. And I'm, you know, I'm still working on it. So I'll always be working on it, trying to understand, you know, that stuff. But Really, you can live with it while you're healing. 
Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things you and I talked about, and a word that comes up often in the context of compassion and really trying to figure stuff out, is forgiveness. Forgiveness, right? And that, where does that have to start, Bev? You have to put yourself out of the way. You have to see the other person. My mom, you know. I don't know what my mom's like life was like when she was a child. I don't know what my grandfather's life and my grandmother's life was like when they were on shop. So, you know, it goes on all these generations. We 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 have this and we 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 don't know. So we have to kind of just forgive or forget some of that stuff. I mean, if you want to do ancestry and figure that out, that's wonderful. But at that point, and I am, I am doing that. But um, you can't keep that with you every day and every time you are with your parent, because you won't have you won't have a a good relationship or any relationship. And really, you're not only hurting, you're hurting yourself more. Than well, and that's what you just said. So I'm listening to you, Bev, and I'm thinking, okay, I get it. I I don't uh, no I'm I'm not going to do that I'm still mad right mm -hmm. and and isn't that from the child's perspective even though we grew big and had our own families we're st aren't we still looking for that parental validation on some level always and so if we so the the forgiveness thing that I've thought about a lot and talked with a lot of people. Uh, if I can forgive me first for being deficient in whatever way I am or was and, and thus never validated, and then I go, well, you're the queen of rationalization, so that works, right? So, so, so talk us through, you made a decision as your mother was dying that you were going to put it all aside. Mm -hmm. How did you get there? Were you just tired of the all of the <laughs> so yeah. No, it was just, I think I just saw how it was hurting me and it was hurting my, you know, my kids and it was hurting, um, everybody, you know, and, um, I finally, I did, I always wanted to please her. I could never please her. There was never way, no way in the world that I would have ever pleased her. So I finally got to the point where I can't please her and I'm not going to try to please her. And when I did that, we had a better relationship. Isn't that ironic? Isn't that, that ironic? Because it was always like, oh, look what I did. I want to show this to my mom. You know, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter to her. It mattered to me, you know. I think this kind of healing that you're talking about, Bev, and I want and I want you to describe a little bit more of your work, particularly with families. I think this is the kind of healing that not only is so very needed, I think people are hungry for it, but really don't know where to start. Like I said earlier, I can get it intellectually. I don't know how to get it into my heart in such a way that I can finally just let all this go. Well, there's no... Where do you start? There's no one way to start unfortunately there's no um you know we i think a lot of times and we do this you know we we sign up for something to look for uh, a class to teach us to do this and we go one two three up we're done you know this is not that kind of a thing it's it's something that that you have to live through it, nobody is the same. There's no one. Nobody's going to do the same thing that I did, except maybe just say, okay, God, it's in your hands. Or okay, Holy Spirit, or okay, Buddha, whatever. Just putting it out in the out of your mind or out of your body. Where something else can handle it because you're well, 
you can't handle it at that point. You know, you've just got to move on to something else. And and that's where really I'd like you to talk next is you did move on. You had some things you started to do that helped you get a completely different perspective. So share that part of your journey with us. Um, what specifically? <laughs> well, didn't you start going places you hadn't been? Um, were you writing things? The very first thing I did, this was real change because I did very little for my, you know, myself then because my kids were, were, were my main focus. My mother left each of us $5,000. And normally in the, uh, what I would have done was to buy something for Kristen, buy something for Gavin, something for the house, you know, nothing for me, or maybe something for me. A um, coffee. coffee. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or something, whatever. Um, what I did was um, take that money and joined a group of interior designers on a tour. Um, I think it was like it was in January, right, right after New Year's. We went to um, Frankfurt, Germany, where they have a yearly. Um, exhibit where fabrics new fabrics and everything is introduced and it's introduced to the fabric houses the people the companies all around the world and they see what's coming i mean it's not going to be in the stores or in their houses for many many years but i was i saw that and it was so interesting and then from there we went to paris and we went to something similar but it was mostly um, furniture and window treatments. And and it just was something I never thought I would ever do. But it really opened me to the fact that I could really do more things with my life. And I could keep on learning. And I think it made me a more interesting interior designer because I could say that and I had you know, designs and thought of things. And yeah, so that was that $5,000 that my mother gave me. Um, I don't know what my siblings did with it. Who cares? Who cares? It it gave me um, a start to being, being a better Bev. A well, okay. Bev. Okay. My new friend, now I'm going to ask you something, right? So how dare you Take that money from your family. No. Spend it on yourself. Did you get a wild hair? <laughs> a, an ear? <laughs> um, that was before the wild, the wild ear. But yeah, well, my kids, my former husband and my kids just looked at me and like, you're going where? Because I had to get a passport. I had not had a passport. I don't know if anybody had a passport. But yeah, I had to get a passport. And um, yeah, it, they didn't believe it until probably I got on the plane. <laughs> they drove me to. I think for caregivers, that is such a, an important, crazy notion. How do I take care of me? So. Talk more about that, Bev. How? What advice do you have for caregivers who are caught up in responsibility and obligation and resentment and crankiness? And they put themselves on the black bur back burner for a long time, so that when their parent does pass away, what do they do with themselves? Um. I would think that that's a serious issue. Um, I actually started a group when I was in um, working with the hospice in Milwaukee. And, oh, oh, I got a low battery. Oh, boy. Um, a hospice in, in, I started for a group called What's Next. And I had like five people who their parents had recently passed away. And um, 
we just talked about what are they going to do? You know, they're what first thing on their mind was getting rid of the clothes, you know, selling the house. And I said, yeah, you have to do all that. But what are you going to do for yourself? And they had no idea what they were going to do. So my my inclination, Bev, is to suggest we start those kinds of questions, that kind of exploration long before mom or dad pass. So I think so. I mean, I don't know how I got the I had the nerve to do that, but you know. Well, I do think sometimes you just get fed up. You're like, that's it, I'm done with this. And so I'm gonna go do something. Like I said, a wild hair. But I th- again, I think. And caregivers need to hear it over and over and over. You must take care of you. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And most of the people that I have worked with and talked with, I mean, there are so many professional people now who are facing this end for their parents. They're working full-time jobs. They're taking care of their kids. You know, they're running kids to sporting events. Mom and dad are failing. I don't have time for this. Time for me? you got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. How... So unhook that guilt tab for us, if you can. Oh, that's hard. If I think if they could start with just having a, a peaceful few minutes, a peaceful hour, you know, just that kind of read a book. I didn't, couldn't have read. I couldn't have read a book because my mind was that. But um, I think I told you about the artist way. Yes, I um, started the artist way at that time. And one of the things that she, um, Julia Cameron, is the author of the artist way. And one of the things, one of the first things she has you do, is go on a Art, what was it called? Oh my gosh, art date. And um, some sort of a date. I'm sorry, I'll come to me. But anyway, Julia. And um, I thought the first thing I thought was, well, go to the Art Institute, go do this, go. To-. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I went to, I went to a Whole Foods. And I just walk up, walk up and down the aisles. And if that's what they can do, that's fine. Walk up and down, you know, walk around the corner. Don't do anything because you have to do it. Do it because it's in front of you. Be in the present. I think that's hard to do. It absolutely is. And I remember I used to love swinging on swings. And that was one thing as an adult, and I was befuddled about so many different things, you know, going through a divorce, all that. And and to that point, I went and I sat on a swing and I started swinging. And it was amazing what what released, right? So I think it is just do something. Bubbles, bubbles. I think bu- blowing bubbles is very relaxing. I have a, I have a bottle right here on my little porch and I... I do that. Um, I actually, I have some that are flavored for the uh, with honey and maple or something. So the dog, if the dog pops them, but she doesn't want any part of it. So I'm blowing bubbles. She goes, she goes away. So um, I think just painted a picture for me, Bev. Throwing the bubbles and then going around and trying to pop them with your tongue, so you get the <laughs> maple. You know what? It's it's that silliness and the willing to do some the willingness to do something that makes no sense that has no purpose that just feels good, relaxes yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, I was never that way. I I never I didn't have a chance to really um, do that kind of stuff. It was always there, but I had to go, you know, by the road, just try to not. Yeah, you know, yelled at. I just kept quiet and, you know. I think, and I think more and more people today feel that way. And so coming back to the, the notion of bullying, I have learned and I truly believe 
that bullies are some of the saddest, most insecure, lonely people that don't have the ability or the trust in themselves to actually know how to interact in a healthy way with other humans. And so compassion for bullies, if you can muster it, right, is a place perhaps to start their healing process as well. Yeah. I know that's kind of a stretch for many of us, but. (laughs) I've tried. Um, You know, recently where I'm living, we have one that's kind of bullyish. And um, I've gotten out, gone out of my way to get to know her. And once I've got to know her, she's easier to be around. Um, I see her with other people, but she's not bullying me anymore. But Well, and I think that, again, from the caregiver's perspective, being willing to take a step Mm -hmm. being willing to put your own difficulties aside and reach out and be open to um i i often hear people say i don't want to i'm i'm done being the adult okay well what does that mean you're gonna you know throw yourself on the ground and have a fit and stomp your feet what what does that accomplish and Mm -hmm. and more than that it doesn't give you any sense of peace or mastery or relief yeah, and one thing you don't want after this person passes is you don't want to have regrets because you're you're living with those regrets. That person is at peace now. And if you have those regrets of, oh, I should have done that, I should have done, you know, we should ourselves all the time. And you don't want that. You don't want those regrets. I don't have any regrets of how, you know, I know I – we all could have gotten along much, much better, but I don't have any regrets of how I uh, treated my mom and how I think I helped her bring peace. To- you know, and I think that if I if I think about, again, practical tips that we can encourage people to do, if we were to simply stop ourselves before an interaction, a visit, whatever, and say, if this were the last... How do I want that person to feel, right? And, and, oh, by the way, if we're full of anger and resentment, I want them to be be guilty about how terrible they made me feel. Well, really, is that is that it? Um, and really to work through that. So it's, I think it's an exercise we need to continue to think about and say, what is, if this may be my last moment on earth, what is the last thing I want to leave, right? And I think that when we can, help each other continue to think about those things and encourage each other to let go some of the stuff that we simply can never change. It's over. And, and, and rethink about how do I want to be now going forward? I think that helps, but it's a, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. I'm not sure that if I wouldn't have had that peaceful moment with my mom that I would have taken that $5,000 and gone and done something good for my career. I mean, I did it not just for me, I did it for my career so I could be more productive in, in what I was doing at the time. And that was because of her. And I'm very thankful for that. And I always will be. And yeah. Yeah. So the, the whole the notion of forgiveness and then the ensuing gratitude is a beautiful thing. And everybody who's been through something like that can attest to that. The challenging part is when you are in the middle of it, how in the world do I get there? Right. And that's the encouraging one another piece, which is why we do these compassion chats. So we are 50 minutes into this, Bev. Can you believe it? We're talking almost an hour. I do want to give everybody an opportunity to ask a question, put it in the chat, whatever, make a comment if you have them um, before we ask for your final words of wisdom. I have a question. Okay. My laptop is low, very low. Okay. Um, 
move over to an outlet? <laughs> no, no, we'll see. There's I'm not seeing anything come up in the chat in the in the questions. So I will simply ask you, Bev, give us your last word of advice. Okay. As caregivers, we want the peace you have found. <laughs> well, you know, peace comes and goes, but um, I think if you keep going back to what you really want, you know, it, I worked with, as a, as a designer, I worked with people who had million dollar houses and they thought that when their house were perfect, that their lives would be perfect. And that's not what does it. It's having a, a clear mind and knowing and putting your priorities in order and not making it um, something that you can hold in your hand. Um, you know, don't put your... Uh, don't put your love on material things. Look at look at what's in front of you. Your mom, your dad, your kids, yourself, you know? Look at yourself. I didn't do that very often and I'm doing it more. And um it's not easy. I'm going to tell you it's not easy. It's not there's no one two three step. But as long as you um Take, take a little care of yourself. You have to walk around the Whole Foods or Hy-Vee or wherever. <laughs> that was such a great story. I love that. Because just getting out and just seeing something else and getting your mind off of your responsibilities helps clear your mind. And um, by doing that, you'll think of something better to do. Well, and Bev, you are such a beautiful representation of that. I think about getting to know you, the, the children's books you've written, the books you are yet to write, just the sense of comfort that you bring people. Isn't that an amazing thing that came out of some real pain for you? And that I find that very inspirational. And I'm convinced that every person alive today has something to give. To all of us, we all have stories, and we want to. Everybody wants to hear those stories. Absolutely, thank you Beth, so much for for your work, for your time, for your tremendous sense of humor. I love it. I walked around Whole Foods. I got to try that. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. And there's Great Gray again for all of you who have joined us, and we'll see this later. Thank you for your time, for your interest in sharing compassion with one another. SusanAMarshall.com is where you can find our compassion chats. Bev, can I Bev get a, my website? Yes, please. BevDavisAuthor.com. BevDavisAuthor.com. Thank you. Go find Great Gray. He's awesome. <laughs> Thank you all. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next month.